Welcome to the Plant Cunning Podcast, where we explore a relationship to plants, other people, and the mysteries of nature. Coming to you from the High Allegheny Plateau in central New York, we are your hosts, A.C. Staubel and Isaac Hill. Okay, so today on the Plant Cunning Podcast, we have Ken Asmus from Oikos Tree Crops. I'm very excited about this episode. I've wanted to interview him for a long time. He's a really cool dude, and we talk about all sorts of things regarding plants, plant breeding, what the future of orchards and home orchards, home nurseries are, what the future of American chestnut is, all these really interesting conversations. And he has some unique takes on a lot of this stuff. So uh, I I think you're going to really enjoy this episode. Uh, But before we get to the episode, I want to remind folks and also inform folks who don't know that we are having a conference, an in-person conference at our small farm for September 9th and 10th. And we're going to have some amazing speakers, including Matthew Wood, Kate Gilday, Lisa Fazio, Zamboni Funk, me, Daryl Fry. And we're going to have herbalism, astrology, folk magic, permaculture, all these really fun, fun topics. And uh, there are a limited number of tickets. And right now we have the early bird pricing. It's only 150 bucks for just the ticket. And that's a really good price. So before they jump up in price, you should get your tickets. They're going to jump in July. The link will be below. And I hope you enjoy the episode. So today on the Plant Cutting Podcast, we have Ken Asmus. And Ken is the owner of the legendary Oikos Tree Crops Nursery, which now only sells seeds, but it was it's an amazing nursery I got. I've been ordering from it for years and it has some of the most interesting plants that you can get, like a lot of wild type and like new hybrids of different species and so on. And we're really honored to have Ken on the show today. So how are you, Ken? I'm doing good. It's a beautiful spring this today, so really nice out. Nice. Sunny and everything is flowering. Yeah. Oh. I brought some things in. So. Beautiful. Yeah. Little That's daffodils, awesome. little lilacs. Oh, nice. And yeah. you're in Michigan, right? Yes. Yeah. Awesome. And I, I, I even grow lilacs at my farm. I was interested in lilacs. So pretty much anything I was interested in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Lilacs are pretty amazing. I mean, this, that smell is, you know, unparalleled. It is. Yeah. Pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. yeah yes. Great. So, Ken, what brought you to the plant path to begin with? Well, as a, I think my interest in plants kind of was almost accidental in some ways, but I just loved working in my backyard when I was a kid. So I just enjoyed seeing flowers and I enjoyed seeing the insects on the flowers. I was really like glued to bugs. I like to collect bugs. So I had like a butterfly collection. But, uh, you know, and I had, I was very interested in the yard. We had this small garden. And uh, so I started growing vegetables and my first vegetable was kohlrabi. I remember that Mm -hmm. for some reason I loved kohlrabi. It is good. uh, My neighbor, my neighbor showed me the kohlrabi and I said, I can grow that. And so, cause it's like the center of a cabbage taste, you know, with salt. I just thought this was the greatest gift ever. Mm -hmm. So. But then by accident, I used to, my mom used to give me plums or prunes and I'd throw the the prune pits near the door. And I noticed one spring there was like little seedlings coming up and I go, what is this? You know? And so I took those and put them in a pot under the tree. And I started telling people about that. And I noticed that they didn't believe me. And I was like, boy, that people don't believe that that. You know, that, and so then I started doing that with oranges and other things in my yard. And it was kind of a standing joke a little bit later on. My, my mom told me that she would accidentally like dig them under or something or destroy them. And it was kind of funny, but I would just go, well, I'll just do it again. You know, (laughs) it's okay. I don't care. But I just enjoyed seeing something grow from seed, you know. Wow. And then as time went on, my family had Christmas tree plantations. And that was rather accidental too in many ways. But it was there was a hundred and thirty acre farm 
that we had in, near Saginaw, Michigan. That's where I grew up. And then we bought another farm that was close to about 400 acres. And they grew a lot of Christmas trees. And my brother and I, we worked there in high school and also in between, you know, the summers in college, pruning Christmas trees, doing everything Christmas trees. And I really like that. And it kind of taught me the idea of tree crops. You know, what could you grow long term, but wouldn't be in such an intense use of the land? I mean, Christmas trees are pretty intense, but, you know, you can grow other things grew around the Christmas trees. And I started noticing those plants. And then I started like researching what is it these plants do or have. And uh, that's where I started getting involved with the edible wild things. And probably my, you know, the, the, culmination of that was a close friend of mine in high school. I said, what we'll do is we'll hitchhike up <laughs> Mackinac city. And there was this lake that was kind of isolated that I knew about. And we'll go back in there. And we'll just see what we can find and just eat oh. off the lamb. And it was, it was fun because he knew nothing about this, about camping or anything, but I was more schooled in it. And I had books that I carry with me and we research, you know, we'd eat cattails or clams or whatever, fish a little bit, and then pick berries. And I kept, I did that periodically. Sometimes I'd go by myself. And then other times I would, you know, later I went with my family to these things and I would look for things. But I noticed in that process, there were many other people doing the same thing. They were kind of like looking for wild blueberries or thimbleberries or something. And, uh, you know, I was like, boy, this is kind of interesting. So when I finished college, I said, well, I got to, I have to do something with the plant thing. And that's how I ended up in the nursery industry. I worked as a, in a retail garden center for a year and also at a wholesale nursery. And then I started my own farm by just looking for a vacant land and empty land. And I found 13 acres, which was a field. And then I slowly started adding to that. Awesome. So that's Just how like that. Goes. And that's how it feels about <laughs> Very <starting>. simple. <laughs> it seems like a very natural progression. Oh, yeah. It just worked out. And there were a few bumps along the road, but I remember thinking, well, I can see where this small farm could develop these things. And then I would buy a bigger farm. But really, it was such a hard industry to make a lot of profit from. And it was kind of slow, but it always improved every year, pretty much. And then I realized, you know, after some time in it, I was going to have good success with the plant breeding and the so-called plant breeding or whatever you want to call it. And just, you know, I seemed to be like a hub for a while of exchanging seeds and doing this. And that was working very well. So I was like, well, I'm going to keep this going because I see the value in it. And I can share that with people for a small amount and make a little bit of a living doing that. And I did. So that was, that was also successful, yeah. but, but it was difficult really running the nursery. So yeah, it's a lot of work. <laughs> it was amazing. A, a major amount of work. I, I met many wonderful people in it and some not so wonderful, but mostly wonderful <laughs> stuff, but it really was a great experience knowing all these folks that were, that I hired in particular. You know, maybe some were out of jail or some were having problems at home with things, or is it kind of a temporary job for people that would work for me? And I had maybe five or 10 people at a shot working there during the busy season. So it was just a small nursery and we did pretty good, I think. So, yeah. I just want to say, I love that imagery of you as a kid planting, accidentally planting your prune seeds. And yeah. And just that love that you developed early on for nature and, and developed further as a youth, like going out and spending time camping in nature and eating the wild foods. I think that's, it's really cool. So thanks for sharing that. You're welcome. You know, to me that and looking back now, that was the most important thing. Yeah. I can't think of anything else. Yeah. You know, you share something with somebody else, it makes a huge difference. So now I'm you know, that I don't have this farm to manage like I did. I am fixing it up and I'm bringing more people into my farm than I ever used to. I'm inviting everyone. Mm. So whoever is listening to this, if you want to visit my farm, you can, but there is a cost. It's okay. called coffee. 
<laughs> sometimes we meet at the coffee place first before we go over there. So sometimes I'll may I'll, I may ask you know we'll meet here and then we'll go just in case they think I'm some kook or something too. So, but I also don't know a lot of people. So my wife mentioned to me she goes, "Well, do you know these people?" I go, "No." No. Well, maybe I should meet them for coffee first. Like, well, that's a good idea anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's really smart. Yeah, that's fun. <laughs> well, I think that other, the other part of the nursery business that you're talking about being kind of like a hub. Yeah. These different plant genetics from across oh, yeah. the world, really. That was one of the things that I loved so much about your nursery is like how yeah. many different species you had and how many that you couldn't get anywhere else. So that's a good question, actually. So because this freedom that we have to exchange seeds worldwide has been taken away from us, I, I personally believe that should be expanded again. But there's so many laws now regulating the distribution of seeds that an individual making a discovery cannot share that seed with someone else in another country. And this is a problem. And I, I felt personally, I felt, you know, that was a, not a good decision. I, I still think it should be this idea of sharing seeds is something that we need to continue on a personal level. But having said that, there are many op opportunities now for people to do that without within the United States now, in particular, because what's happened is people have taken certain genuses or varieties and have created these orchards or plantings of them. And now there's more diversity available or becoming available than I, when I first started. So the issue in the beginning was I was just doing writing letters because it's before, you know, I'd, I'd write a letter and, hey, what's going on? And I'd meet somebody somewhere. And they'd say, well, I'm interested in this and I'm interested in that. Okay. And we'd exchange. So there'd be, to get, you know, just people with similar interests. So maybe it was oaks and they go, boy, that acorn, that's a good acorn. Can you send me some? And they go, yeah. So we would do that yeah. back and forth. And it was, some of it was international and m most of it was it within the boundaries of the U.S. And, uh, but it allowed you to explore that diversity in a very simple way through exchange. And you have that now on Facebook with many different groups that go, well, I got this and maybe someone will buy it or personal mess. So it's much faster. And then you'll also see it on eBay and Etsy and all these selling groups now too. So there's a lot, a lot of ways to get seeds and plants. But the, the, the beginning idea was to be able to make selections either culti from cultivated plants mostly, some wild plants, but mostly cultivated. And that's not normally done. And the way that works is like in an arboretum, they go, well, our seeds are not going to be true because we have so much diversity. They probably hybridized and they don't, you know, that's not something that they don't want garden plants, plants that come from a garden necessarily. They want wild collected from known sources. And this goes back to the early 1900s where if you're going to create a collection of plants then you need to have the original wild ones. Mm -hmm. And I didn't, I didn't want that. I wanted cultivated plants that people knew about and had some sort of connection to it, especially in terms of food. Like, oh, this was delicious. You know, yeah. this wild peach that was growing in the mountains in Germany is fantastic. And it's small, but it's delicious. Mm. And I was like, well, then I got to get that peach. I want that. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> so, or maybe someone brought this peach seed to the United States when they immigrated here and it's growing from pits, yeah. you know, and I was like, well, I'm very excited about that. And that's not normally something you'll find in an arboretum, but some, some arboretums are starting to recognize heritage fruits now. And they're saying, okay, well, you know, maybe we should have a collection of this. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, that's, that's a whole different genre of food and plants and so forth. And so it's hard to find people like that usually. But for some reason, because of my interest in it, there was one other person that helped me 
And he was just phenomenal at sourcing these seeds. And I don't mention his name only because he never wants me to mention his name, but this one individual did probably more good to me than anyone else. And wow. it's because of his ability to collect and resource seeds. Wow. So, and then I also exchanged with the International Dendrological Society, which I, is a member, I am a member of and, or was, I don't know if I'm still at a current membership, but they were very, that group at the time before the laws really were enacted, people would go on trips to different parts of the world and they'd say, well, look at this interesting large tree. This is a fantastic launch. And then you put a on stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and, but it was, it's kind of funny because they're very passionate about these trees. And those are the types of folks that I like, you know, I yeah, like, totally. wait, I got to hang around that group, you know, and same with the fruit people. I was like, I just like being here. I don't know why, but you know, they would just, you know, they talk about it like almost like critiquing or evaluating nature in some way, but then they would, you know, but then they would all come together and say, well, this still is fantastic, no matter how you think about it. And uh, I think part of that was being able to save something that could be gone. It yeah. could lost over time. And, and I know for a fact in some of my plantings at my farm, I'm the only one that has it now. Wow. And that bothers me. Yeah. yeah. Because a flood or fire or the person died. They're so, it's so, you know. Ephemeral. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Sure. Yeah, so you're sharing the plants and seeds and that that's part of like the mission at, at Oikos, I'm imagining, right? Yeah, so I still sell, sell them, but I'm not happy with that arrangement, even though I set it up myself. <laughs> really, I mean, I'm not really happy with it because I want to exchange more. And yeah. I find that people are not really doing that as much anymore or something. Yeah. People don't know what exchanging is. But normally, I still do exchange. I still send out things, but I'm trying to find other nurseries that'll sell and grow the plants. Mm -hmm. And I have found a couple, so I'll try to work on that. But cool. the, the thing is, I don't want it to be another damn business. So, right. Yeah. You know, I'm just, want to preserve. I, yeah. I, you know what, if I can get people out there and walk around and I get free coffee, then I'll probably be <laughs> something like that. I don't know. I just want people to come and visit and taste mm -hmm. pawpaws or persimmons. Yeah. And it's fun, you know, especially if they own, I had a couple people that own food related businesses and then I'd give it to them and maybe they would um, make something cool out of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I like that. You know, it's Maybe. just a lot more fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then things like pawpaws and persimmons are getting more popular now because oh, yeah. I use them and they're like, make, there's pawpaw beer and all that kind of stuff. Is there really? Yeah, yeah, they make pop beer. <laughs> Holy cow. I mean, I think yeah. they, I don't think they use like a, it's like more of a flavor than like using the sugar from the pop to bake the beer, but you know, yeah, still, I mean, the idea. Yeah. <laughs> but I would like to ask though, like, what has been your gardening philosophy over the years? Oh, what do you mean by that? Like a philosophy? So, have you been influenced by like permaculture and like forest gardens? Do right. you just like throw as many different species in, in as you can and see what does well? Are you um, doing row cropping? You know, like are, what kind of, what is your garden like? Yeah. And, What's your vision? What's your ideal uh, of, of garden? And, well, know. the, the, uh, trying to think of that, it's, it's confusing for people when they come to my farm because they see these different little pockets of things. Uh -huh. planted amongst other things. Uh -huh. So if you were to stand anywhere on my farm, no matter where, you would see, you know, 20 or 30 species of things right off the bat. And so when you see that much diversity, it's like, what, you know, <laughs> what, what is that? And so some people <laughs> are very confused by that. But the other little pockets, if you get them into a pocket of, say, a peach is surrounded by apples, chestnuts, and pecans, like I have pecans, pears, peaches, wild, edible acorns, and then a row of wild goose plums. So you're standing there and you're like, 
you know, you look around and you just see these groupings that are kind of mashed together. Mm. So, so it's not like quite, a mosaic. It's almost like a tapestry. Ooh. Yeah. So it's not like an orchard, but it's also not quite like a forest either. Yeah. Right. And, you know, I, part of it was I thought, well, I'll create some sort of structure early on. And what I did was I used hickories for that. Okay. Mostly yeah. hickories and walnuts. So I knew those were going to get big. Yeah. So I planted those out on the perimeter. And so the idea of the forest garden really is a great idea, but the, the issue becomes shade. Yeah. And so what happened is some of it was planted too dense, but others it was fine. And, but the, it left these pack pockets open. And then when things die, then I can replace them with something more that you know, I'm interested in or I happen to have at the time. Yeah. Yeah. So basically you're looking at like maybe a row of something in some places, and then there's a gap maybe where I drive. And then there's another, there might be a small row, a 40 foot row of something, but then there might be a little pocket of something like of some junipers or something. And I might experiment with a type of juniper just to see if I can get a, a, a type that maybe produces a lot of berries mm. and the berries are edible. Yeah. Well, you could put them in your mouth and it wouldn't taste like turpentine. <laughs> yeah. Oh, this, this juniper is delicious. Mm. No, who would chew on these, you know? Yeah. And so I'm excited about that. I'm, oh, I got a delicious juniper. Then I have other junipers that are completely sterile almost to a point, the certain hybrid. But those are kind of like my exclamate, what I call an explanation point of my plantings. Yeah. So you can view them as like, oh, I'll put this at the end. And right. then in the middle will be all my peaches or whatever, or plums. So it's kind of a hodgepodge of things in there. And, but it's organized fairly well too. Yeah. So. So different to... than, different than your roots at the Christmas tree farm. Yeah. So the Christmas. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Quarter mile rows of, of right. spruce. Uh -huh. Yeah. It's wow. It was. <laughs> yeah. That's so, so gonna... cool. Yeah. I would like to take you out for coffee and come see sometime. Everyone is welcome. You are welcome. Right. I would love to have you. Thank you. Amazing. Let me tell you. Field trip. Yeah. Totally. Yes, it would. I have seen some of the, your YouTube videos of like your pawpaw patch and, yeah. and, and so on. And the, the, the plum thickets. Mm -hmm. Yes. It is. It's, it's different than, than an orchard. I mean, like, um, yeah. because the, that, that, they don't grow that way. You know? No. No, they don't. And that's, that's another, that's an important point as far as like developing these crops is going, well, how do they grow in the wild? Yeah. And if you're familiar with foraging, you go, geez, this is a whole colony. Yeah. Yeah. Go, well, could I grow a colony? Right. Mm -hmm. Most fruit orchards are not colonies. They're individual plants in a little nicey, tidy row and you drive the tractor in between. Yeah. Well, what if you just let it take over? <laughs> oh, you just let it spread. And that's what I'm doing. I'm mm -hmm. like, okay, this is a great idea. The plant's idea, not mine. Mm -hmm. Right. And it just does that. And I'm going to let that happen. Yeah. Totally. And so I have these colonies that have spread throughout the farm. And, and many of these things will grow as an understory plant and still be fruitful. Wow. And I also have natural seeding of apples and pears. And many of those plants are now fruiting for me. So it's this regeneration through the nursery, the plants themselves, meaning I really don't have to plant anymore. You're just, you quit planting, you let nature plant and you create this real diverse habitat with hundreds of species. Now you could do that on any scale, mm -hmm. uh, but for ha having a place where there's not mowed, not tilled helps in that oh. region. And then you yeah. learn about the reproduction of those plants too. In that process, you go, oh, geez, how far does something spread? Yeah. And then once in a while, I'll sneak on my neighbor's property and look over there. And I'm surprised I don't see that. Hmm. So I'm wondering why it's so endemic to my farm. But I am seeing some of my neighbor's plants 
land and grow on my property. Uh -oh. And I'm like, well, that's kind of cool. How did that work out? You know, how long does that take, huh. you know, for something like that to grow? And I have to have woodland flowers coming up now. Oh, and nice. I was like, like spring beauty. Spring yeah, beauty. like spring beauty of Pipskawa. Oh, really? you know? Yeah. And I'm like, how did that happen? You know. Because you got the vibe right. You, you just are putting out that, like, I love plant vibe. And they're like, yeah. Oh. yeah. <laughs> I, I think there's a, actually, I think that is part of it. Yes. Because you're making something that is a safe haven for everything. Yeah. And you're not necessarily removing this, this, what would be consult, called an invasive plants. You, you let those grow because they protect and nurture the other plants underneath them. So whatever it is, you want a lot of vegetation. It's kind of messy in some places, but then when we go to collect or something, then I'll usually you know, remove larger plants to get in there and then I'll leave, I'll mark the plants that I'm trying to save in there. So there's underneath a lot of the trees, there's, there might be shellbark hickories coming up. There might be yeah. apples. I mean, yeah. oh, that looks like a good apple. I'm going to okay. leave an apple. Yeah, totally. And uh, I don't know. I just, I love doing that. So really it's becomes more and more diverse over time. And I just, I, I limb them up a little bit. So I may prune the branches. Yeah, hmm. so I can get them past where the deer do not browse on them. Mm -hmm. So it really just started with the idea of that. I didn't really think about that in the beginning, whether something would spread. I just thought about the individual plants. Yeah. But if you don't mow or do much maintenance, things will start reseeding. And you can dig those up and move them, too, if you wanted to. So you have your right. own history. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what have been some of your biggest successes as far as plants go? Like plants that really like knocked your socks off and like did really well, were, were really tasty and easy to propagate, disease resistant. Well, the one thing that I, that I loved and I had the most success with was plums. Uh -huh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. And these wild plums. I, I was a little shocked at that because I didn't really know anything about them. And I think it was through the North American Fruit Explorers that I met someone that was into beach plums. It's an Eastern seaboard plant. Yeah. But I wasn't really familiar with it. And I started growing the beach plum. And then in, on Lake Michigan and Lake Superior, we have like a sand cherry, which is a little dark red fruit, like the Western sand cherry. And I started growing those and making jam out of it. My, my mom taught me how to make jam. So I was always making jam. And then I would take that with me to talks that I gave. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I'd have all these jars out and then bring, I, in fact, I did one on Saturday and I would bring little crackers, you know, oh, mm -hmm. this is good. You know, people love it. Fun. And that, the plum was just so diverse. It was so amazing. There were so many kinds and there were some that tasted just like sweet cherries. Some were just so sweet and bland almost. And then others are very extremely tart. And I was like, oh my gosh, it's just a range of flavors from that. And it was so easy to grow, no diseases or insects to speak of. Nice. And I did have some failures with that as well. But as you know, the failures were more or less based on, I'm learning about it. It's still a six. <laughs> yeah. didn't fruit but at least i know yeah totally. but some of the more common what would be considered wild plums in europe don't do as well here in north america right well here they get black knot really yeah well. oh yeah that's who yeah so yeah <laughs> that, that that was one thing i you know started planting prune plums and so on and they they just all got black knot and so they oh. go, I guess not no plums, but then there's all these American plums and how many, yeah. there's a bunch of different species too, right? Yeah. So that was the one thing is when I was driving around in the fall, a lot of times I'd be, you know, I'm probably like what you call an armchair botanist or something. Oh, oh yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Drive, we call it drive by botany. Yeah. Yeah. Drive by botany. Yeah, exactly. That's yeah, exactly this guy's it. dangerous. <laughs> yeah. Well, you can get in accidents. I don't like <laughs> You, know, you pull off the road and you don't realize it's a ditch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 We've all had that experience. 
Yeah, we had to rescue my herb teacher from a field trip in, we were in like Montana or something at the time. We drove off the road in a ditch and we like couldn't find him for hours, but we, <laughs> so I know it's, ah. it can be dangerous, but the plants, they call when the plants call. Yeah. And, and then you're just almost like in shock sometimes. You go, oh, look at that. Look at that. Yeah. So they, the plums, you know, plums, you can see at quite a distance too. And so sometimes they're in people's yards and I'd knock on doors. Sometimes they're in, they were one group of them that I found was a consumer's power office play. Oh. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, I walk in there and they're thinking, I'm, what's wrong with this guy? Yeah. Yeah. You can pick it off the lawn if you want. But I, what I realized was at that time, I was like, oh, there's quite a bit of diversity within the genus, mm -hmm. but what about all the other species? Mm -hmm. And one of, the, one of the greatest plants that I grafted, actually, I brought into my farm was a wild goose plum mm -hmm. because this had been lost. And another plum collector who has since passed on sent me the cyan wood, and I got, I think, seven or eight trees established from it. Mm -hmm. So I was able to save that plant. Wow. But at the same time, bring out a population of them. And it was through that, being able to spot them along the roads or other plants too. The big, the big thing for me was, at the time, was edible acorns. Mm -hmm. you know, all, all acorns are, are edible, but I was looking for one that had low tannins. Mm -hmm. And I worked with, again, the seed exchange, and we were sending each other acorns in the mail, and um, which seems kind of weird at you. <laughs> you got some acorns? Great. <laughs> but, this is odd. But anyway, <laughs> like, man, those are great acorns. <laughs> I can top that. Yeah. <laughs> then I put some in. <laughs> you know, but it was it was exciting uh, getting a package of unique acorns. And the one thing was there was a guy I met from Oklahoma, and uh, he he said. He's a forester and he goes, check out, you know, I'm going to send you some acorns and it'd be wise if you could take over the sweet acorn group in North American Fruit Explorers. And then at the same time, you know, continue to develop, develop them. And I was like, that is a good idea. And so through my plantings, I met other individuals that actually were hand pollinating and breeding too. And they created very low tannin acorns that almost you could eat raw. Oh, wow. wow. Yeah. And so I have a couple of those varieties from that. But it was through cool. the initial, initial acorn exchange that created that, the varietal levels. And then I, I started growing those and selling those at my farm. So Nice. Yeah, I've got a couple of those. They're still very small. Good. Uh, from your stock, yeah. Good. <laughs> well, they do. Good. <laughs> Excellent. So there you, you chick, so Chickasaw plum is another plum that I, I got from you, which I'm yeah. excited about. So that, but those plums, the other thing about the plums is that you can't do them in orchards in the same way because they, they, they sucker, but so you have, so it's better in a way to have to grow them from seed because then there's a thicket. Right. But the, yeah. Yeah. And the, the oaks though, <laughs> you have enough kind of a lot of space for them. You do. Yes, yes, but both of those. But another plant that I've, I got from you, I'm really excited about, and I'm, I'm growing other, other selections is, is American persimmon. Oh yeah, oh yeah. such golden, yeah. delicious. But where where you are, where we are, we are the problem with the they are they're hardy here, but the problem yeah. is ripening. Right. Yeah. So, how, what's your experience been with 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 American persimmon? So the the way that kind of the way. I went to a, a nut growers meeting. I can't remember where it was. I think it was here in Michigan. And they had some persimmons there. And I'd read about it through other books that I'd gotten, but I wasn't really familiar with the plant. And the, I was at the meeting and someone had brought some. And I was like, well, I'll taste it. And I was like, boy, this is not that good. You know, and I was trying to figure out why is this so crusty and had a little, you know, astringency in it. I'm like, I don't know about this, you know. And they're like, well, this is Michigan, you know. You can't expect miracles, you know. Uh -huh. Well, yeah. you know, he goes, well, I ripen mine on my 
my heater in my office this one guy said or something. I was like, well, that, okay. So then as time went on, I found out there were varieties of them. And I said, well, I'll, I'll start growing them at my farm and make them available. I didn't have any plantings of them. So I bought from a processor that made persimmon pulp called Dimples Delight. And they're in Mitchell, Indiana, which is, you know, I think that's lower central Indiana. And they would make this gook that was in a, like kind of a, a can. It was filled with corn syrup and, and mm. so forth. And yeah, it was kind of gross. But they, they, were, they were like the main go-to for seeds because they had a processing plant. Right. And you could buy the seeds. So I started growing lots of them, the trees. And uh, I met a guy from Illinois who said, oh, you know what? You can grow other varieties and, uh, you know, select from those. And I was like, okay, well, I'll do that. So I was buying more and more seeds on it and growing a lot of it. Finally, I ended up with a lot in my nursery and I go, well, I'm going to just surround my farm with these. <laughs> So I planted them maybe five or seven feet apart, and I had roughly about 1,800 running feet of them, wow. on both, you know, around the farm. And then I said, well, we'll just see what happens, you know. I, I mean, there's really nowhere to go in Michigan to see if you could grow persimmons here. And what I found was I could definitely grow them, and there was some variation in the ripening, but most of them because of my seed selections, did very well here. Nice. Hmm. And so, yeah, I was very happy about it. Then as I did a little more research, I realized that I not only created one of the most northern places for them, but also I naturally could select those early ripening ones mm -hmm. that yeah. people could graft eventually. Mm -hmm. But I never got that far with it. I was more like, well, who cares? I really <laughs> don't care as long as people can come. So we still have a lot of people that all, they'll come out and we'll shake the trees and they'll pick them up, take them home to eat. Mm -hmm. So I haven't really gotten, I just started making selections from them a little bit last year with the help of another person. And then we're trying to winnow it out a little bit. But it was really accidental planting, but it was done in big, in big enough because they're either male or female. Remember that. And then you have quite a variation in the, Number of seeds in there, the color of the fruit, when it ripens. And then there was, you know, there's one or two trees that out there are green year round. They never ripen. They yeah. stay green. So, but then other people have told me, other, it was one research scientist told me, oh no, that's normal. You would always, in the wild, you'll find trees that are almost always green too. Huh. So it's just part of the genetic makeup of the plant. And that's the, other, that's the other thing about having a big population. You, you can make selections from it, but the population itself might be of value too. Right. And that, I would just say this, when I used to go to, the, to these fruit shows, you know, the, you go to these institutions like Cornell, MSU, Purdue, you go to them and you see these repositories they have in how they create and develop fruit varieties. And that system is not really what it used to be because it's not funded really anymore by public dollars where they come out with new varieties much, if, it, if any. And I think it's closed off to even the public in many ways. But these repositories are still there and they're still being used by the USDA for many things. But it's just impossible to expect somebody else to breed tomorrow's fruit trees for the public. And I think that's going to end up in the hands of individuals. And no. right now, those individuals are not recognized. People ignore them. They don't care. Yeah. But it really, they should be the ones that should be put in charge of all this wasted money that is going towards chemicals. If you look at the money coming in and the, the dollars going into this, should all be thrown out, all of it. It has no value. The value is going to be in what sort of fruit, healthy things that we can raise without spray yeah. and not the sprays themselves. We have to view it as we got to get rid of those Yeah, right away. And I'm, it's just ridiculous that that part of the fruit industry has stayed the same for all these years and hasn't changed. 
I'm not really, you know, I, I got, I became part of the fruit industry when I pruned apple trees in the winter. And when, my, when I was running my nursery, it was kind of a, a supplemental income. And I began to understand what these farmers go through to raise fruit. It's very difficult. I know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you're, if you're a traditional, you know, farmer and you see like the difference between a sprayed apple that you can grow on your farm versus like an organic wild apple that's holy and mealy and, you know, they, yeah. they think like, well, we're doing it right. Look at our apple. Yeah. You know? So what do you, what do you say to that, that farmer? Well, it's not either or. We yeah. can have healthy fruit without the holes and all that. Mm, yeah. But we have to put some attention on that. We have to make these repositories more involved with the public. And yeah. right now we're giving everything, we're giving the responsibility to somebody else. And they, I think they fail. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, they're, I'm sorry, you had your shot at it. Next. Yeah. Next. And a lot of these. <laughs> Next in line, please. Yeah, right here. And, and those next in line, I feel, are these individual plant breeders. And you'll see them on Instagram and stuff that are working on new apples. And they're trying to breed them for their own uses. Might be a cider or something like that. But they also, also have made huge discoveries on what is an insect-free fruit. How to oh, have that. And how can that be maintained? How can we have these? More or less a type of orchard like my farm that is a repository that, that is available to the public in an open way and also kind of creates its own breeds. So getting rid of the, getting rid of a plant breeder is a great idea and getting rid of a nursery is even better, but it probably won't happen for a while. But, <laughs> but if you can get, if you can get it to a point where there are these public places that people can go and pick fruit, just like thimbleberries, as we were discussing earlier, for enjoyment. Then people will begin to see how really beautiful the fruit industry is and not such an impossible thing to summit. Because right now, the land costs, the machinery, you have to be very, very rich or born into it to be a, a fruit growth. Yeah. It's just impossible. Yeah, one of my farmer friends told me one time, if you want to make a million bucks farming, you got to start with two million. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's, that's true. And a lot of, a lot of farmers, I would go, well, what do you do for, you know, some of them had, many of them had other jobs. Yeah. And so they're working two jobs. It's mm -hmm. very difficult. Totally. And then some, some had money and other things. I remember one, one farmer was a writer of some fiction or something and it made a lot of money selling a book cool. some or something. I was like, oh, yeah. that's interesting. Got to get creative. Yeah. yeah. One owned an oil company, a oh, small wow. oil company. Well, that would help. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What you were saying about like the public places for people to really connect with fruit, the fruit and in, nut in industry. We went to this really cool place in Florida when we were on vacation this year, the Fruit and Spice Park. Yeah, it's a state park. It's, it's a state really? park. Yeah. It would, anybody you should definitely it's go. It's like South Florida. Wow. It's tropical. It's all tropical fruit and spices. You would love it. Yeah. Oh, my and gosh. It's, yeah, it's a bunch of acres, and you can walk around. There's beautiful trails, and you can harvest any of the fruit on the ground. Yeah. Oh, wow. And so there's, you know, some really cool finds. We tried these cocoa plums that yeah. are, They're like. They're wild down there. They're they, really good. They don't have, like, very much fruit. They have a big pit, and you kind of have to, like, chew around the. Yeah. It, but they taste like coconut on the flesh and plums on the skin. It's they're really cool, and they're a wild like native down there, right? Yeah, they're a wild, a wild native. But the, yeah. the, it started yeah. out in like the eighteen hundreds, I think, from really? a private person who yeah. collected all these plants, and then they found some way to like keep it going, and then now they're yeah, yeah. But that I think that is that is really crucial, and and decentralizing the, the right fruit industry right in the nursery industry and i guess that brings us to the topic of like small backyard nurseries because those are starting yeah. to pop up you know yeah. and the, i think that's a that's a, a good transition and a good way forward for a lot of people and for and to get get some of these varieties out 
Yeah. And have it more regionally specific yeah. too. Because yeah. like a lot of these like cloned apples or whatever, they're like you know, red red delicious from Maine to Oregon. And right. necessarily. <laughs> yeah. Right. It, yeah. Yeah. And you're bringing up a point. Point. You have these, it's like nothing in between. You right. have these clones. Then you have the kind of the wild, what becomes conservation type things. But then, you know, you're developing this in-between area. And I think the in-between area is more friendly. Yeah. Like I'm going to go in there. I don't want, I don't mind the orchards. I love orchards and I, I love the wild conservation native only thing. That's fine. But it would be kind of nice if there was an in-between place where we could all just kind of you know, collect or eat the cocoa pumps. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> is that what it's called? Cocoa plum? Yeah. Coco, C-O-C-O plum. Oh, yeah, that yeah. is cool. You I can love see them on the beaches thing. sometimes, like yeah. in, in Southern Florida. <sighs> uh, you ever, if you need to plan a vacation, definitely check it out. The... Yeah, it's, it's a fun, it's a fun, it's like somebody's plant collection. And yeah. it's kind of like an arbor. Yeah. Like a, botan it's a botanical garden, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. but focused on edible like fruits and right. places. Mm. But so as somebody who has had a successful like permaculture type nursery, do you have any any tips for like backyard nursery folks? Well, the one thing I had quite a few calls about uh -huh. that. And I noticed that the it seemed like the few that I had, they didn't want to listen. Really? Oh, really? <laughs> Bad. Yeah, I was like, I told my wife, I said, you know, I don't think I'm going to take any more of those calls. Oh, no. <laughs> Backyard people. But the problem yeah. is that they're. I was probably coming at it from a nursery business standpoint. Wow. And for them, it's more of a supplemental yeah. income thing. Mm. But then I was trying to think, well, how are you going to get your plants from your backyard to your customers? Mm -hmm. And do you want people coming to your house? Right. Oh, so there's that aspect of it. And those types of nurseries, I knew that's really what inspired me because I knew people that had backyard nurseries, even back in the 70s. There were a very small number, but there were people that produced something from their backyard. And I can see that I'm seeing more and more of the value of it. In the beginning, I said, that's not going to work. But what's happened is people with the flower industry now are doing this where they have flowers in their backyard and you can go pick up flowers. Mm -hmm. And so you can cut your own there or they'll also also make bouquets for you. Mm -hmm. And those same, those some same places are maybe only a few acres and one acre in size and they'll develop it so that, so I see where you could do something like that if you wanted with a backyard nursery, barter or exchange for other services or sell it. But you should understand that, you know, the work involved, you know, and the interruption of your personal life with someone coming to your home to buy something. Mm -hmm. I, there's some aspect of that is the other part of it is it should be, it should be licensed. You should license it as a business mm -hmm. and, you know, treat it like a business in some ways. Mm -hmm. Think about your time that you spend doing it. Now there's someone that said, well, Ken, the backyard nursery industry is taking a lot and you're, you know, you're a fuddy duddy and you should take a look at, you know, what, what it is they're doing. And here's an example. And they'll show that there's someone on YouTube. And I said, well, yeah, that's true, but he has 250,000 followers. And you have to realize that is no longer a backyard nursery. Yeah. I mean, technically mm -hmm. I only had maybe at the most 25,000 on my mailing list. And now this guy's got two, a quarter mil. Yeah, yeah it's And he's prime. selling advertising. You know, he, yeah. it's the advertising probably making enough money from his YouTube channel where he no longer has to worry about the plants. <laughs> That's not bad. I don't care how that works. But the fact is there are many people that want to have these plants that someone else has from their yard. And I think that's just going to expand over time. How that works into a business model, I have no idea. I, I'm out. <laughs> I'm sorry. But it's a great idea. What you're saying is regionally adapted plants. Yeah. Come yeah. grew them themselves from seed, maybe from their own plants. Right. 
and maybe they get a cup of coffee for it. I don't know. Well, yeah. Well, I mean, the, the, the things that are good about it is like if you have a, a, an established forest garden, you have access to of the scion wood and mm. the seeds. Yeah. And everything like right. That. And then with the internet, you have like Etsy and, you know, yeah, marketplace and so on. So there is, you can, you can sell a scion exchange and so on. Yeah. Groups. But it, it does, there is, it does seem like, yeah, it's more of a hobby than, a way to have like a like a, a main income yeah so then there's side certain, hustles are there's like a lot of people have a lot of different side hustles though too so yeah side hustle. yeah it's a special person that does that i, I i'm i'm warming up to the idea more than the beginning but i think one thing that i discovered in that process was that people are very passionate about some particular one type of plant in particular oh. they might just be into cider apples they might be just into hazelnuts and they'll spend a lot, they'll focus their energy on that one plant. And I think there's a strong connection between that, whoever that person is and that one plant. They're like, man, I just love these apricots. I love these. And they'll just work on that and nothing else. And those are the types of individuals that you're like, oh, I got to meet this person or I get, see if I can get some seeds out, out of it. Yeah. There's people that are into sea berries. For instance, that's a big thing now. Yeah. Yes. And there's people into elderberries. Mm. Very, you know, that's really growing. And then, you know, those are the types of things that you, you know, that you can really benefit from right away. And the backyard nurseries, if it's someone very diverse, it's good if it is in your region, at least you can go and get something. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. But you think it, another, the other way to do it is just like the exchanging, just exchanging. Yeah. In a, in a normal kind of gift ex economy. Yeah, I, I like that idea. Mm -hmm. I don't know how it would work, you know, as practically, but yeah, I, I think that's a great idea. Exchange. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, just, you know, I, this year I've been doing that too with like Scion, Scion groups and so on. Yeah. Do, yeah. It's a good way to do it and to get access to, to genetic material that, you know, you would have to pay a lot of money for or you wouldn't have access to. Right. Yeah. Because then, especially if you're a collector, then you have you have your own things you can trade. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. You find people find stuff all the time. Really fantastic things. I'm, I'm always surprised. I'm like, man, that is fantastic. Yeah. It's it's just it's so uplifting. It really is. Mm -hmm. Nature doesn't want us to die. Yes. Yeah, you know, we so. went through COVID and it was like, oh my gosh, this whole thing is so. But nature, nature keeps. It's such a giving. It's just always, yeah. always, always giving, always. And, you know, it's something, you know, I try to, I, I want to be like that, you know. Oh, oh. Don't you? Everyone does. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. There, there's one other question that I have in my mind that I didn't get to ask earlier when we were talking about specific plants, but <laughs> do you mind if we have another, another question? No, ask away. I'm fine. Okay. So it's about chestnuts. Okay. Yes. Well, so I have recently realized, I just found out that apparently, according to the, the people who have been doing the chestnut propagation and, and trying to, to breed a resistant chestnut. Yeah. And if people don't know, Ch American chestnut used to be one, every one in four trees on the eastern really? United States was a, an American chestnut. And then the oh. chestnut blight happened and like, right. or something. That's mm -hmm. And so now there's none of them. There's some stump sprouts. But so people have been trying to breed them. Right. Uh, the, to be resistant with the, and hybridize them with Chinese and others. Right. Stuff. But apparently mm -hmm. that's been failing and they haven't been able to produce an, a timber type, American type tree right. that's also resistant. And so now they're going to genetic engineering to do it. Yeah. And, okay. I mean, let's, I, I'm, not, I, I'm not quite sure how I feel about it yet. I, I, I'm gen generally resistant to GMOs just like right off the bat. But yeah. If it is fail, I don't know. So, but I also know that you have worked with American chestnuts and have done hybrids, and I've seen videos sure. of your columnar, like, oh yeah, trees that yeah. are at least somewhat resistant to the blight. So, yeah. what, what has your experience been with hybrid chestnuts and, and American chestnuts? And do you think that there is a future for non-GMO American type chestnuts? Well, yeah. So. When, that's a big question. 
<laughs> but the short answer is this. The the Chinkapin, there's a Chinkapin group. Uh -huh. And yes. over on in, in Missouri, I think it's Missouri. The Ozarks. Yeah, the Ozarks. Yeah. The Ozark Chinkapin. And there's an Ozark Chinkapin group. And I think they must have looked. I remember meeting the owner of that or the originator of that, not the company, not company, but organization. And they, they had this, he had this idea. I remember early on, he said, well, you know, is it possible not to make, just forget the hybrid thing. Just forget that. Why don't we find some test where we can go out and just test the leaf? And he did. Huh. And they found, yeah, a way to test populations of chinkapin by using a leaf. And then they would test. And then they said, well, look, these particular chinkapins are really immune in these populations. We'll put them all together and we'll create create a population level chinkapin, immune to blight. And they did. Mm -hmm. And their organization distributes the seeds right away. They, it's not a big, long, drawn-out breeding project that takes decades. <laughs> and they did it right away. Yeah. Okay. So there's ways that the breeding projects, you have to realize... Especially the ones with the, you know, I don't, I don't want to make it sound like they were stupid or something, but they just, they had, they followed a certain breeding project from a certain level of science that has changed over the years. And I remember I was very fortunate to meet Dr. Dennis Fulbright, who is one of the leading scholars of chestnut blight here in North America. He, he worked at, he's, he's passed on, but he worked at MSU. And I remember asking him about all this. I'd, man, this is becoming confusing. Can you breed this? Jesus, he goes, can, you can breed, you can make a wild chicken. You can breed, breed a wild chicken. But all you've really done is domesticated it. The more you breed something, the more you domesticate it. Uh -huh. And you're not really breeding anything wild or a species because you're breeding it. Yeah. <laughs> right. right. So it really, the, the scientists working on this really, it's more of a thing where it looks like the American chestnut, but it's highly bred. The more you breed something, the more. So what's happened is they're like, you know what? We're just tired of this. We're just going to GMO. Because everyone yeah. else is. <laughs> yeah. And, and so this whole thing becomes an organization that has, you know, board members and a lot of money exchanging hands. And, you know, people that are in those organizations have told me stories about them. And I'm like, okay, well, all righty. <laughs> it would just be helpful if people just, did not join those organizations and stop giving them money. They, they didn't do it. So quit, quit giving them money. Yeah. And so that would be my suggestion. And as far as GMO, it's just another waste of time and waste of money. It's not going to do anything. It never will. And the, the, the issue becomes also that this blight and the chestnut and Dr. Fulbright told me about this is actually part of the chestnut. Now it's part of the genetics of the chestnut and the chestnut tree is changing. It's wow. developing resistance on its own. We may not see it in our, you know, at first, okay. but we're also seeing that the callus thing that's forming is compartmentalization. It's a very healthy response from a tree. Even a non chestnut tree compartmentalizes and finding trees that compartmentalize damage is, is what they do. You know, finding trees that do it faster is even better. And you could create a population of these hybrid trees that compartmentalize damage much faster. And that, that's been done with some of my plants in another planting by a customer of mine. They, sometimes people will spend a lot of money and do, do it on their own. And this one gentleman, I, a customer of my farm did that. He was able to create populations of these highly resistant Resistant, resistant being 
The blight still attacks, but the tree compartmentalizes the damage, continues to grow and fruit. Right. And the seedlings from that do the same. Yeah. So you could do that. But the idea of a perfect American chestnut, it drives people nuts. <laughs> because it has to look like the old chestnuts from the 1900s. Where Which nobody has ever really seen. <laughs> on the no. East well, they're there's scattered <laughs> here and there. But people find them, yeah, in out, outlying areas outside of, you know, their, their native range. Yeah. So, you know, that there's so many things, ways you could do that without doing any breeding. And then you could do some breeding, but it's turned into this whole thing. Mm, it's turned yeah. into this. Anytime you see, anytime you see this much attention and that much money thrown at something and that many people working in this organization over and over again. And so many, it's like, okay, there's something funky here. Mm. They haven't come up with a solution yet. Like no, but, and next. so then, the, yeah, next. <laughs> I went. No money for you. <laughs> but the problem is, is that people really put their faith in that institution. Mm -hmm. So what are you going to do? You're going to tell them to stop believing? I don't know. I would. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I ne when I had my nursery, I avoided conversations like this all the time. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. I just didn't want to argue. Yeah. It was ridiculous. And even now, I, every now and then I'll get crazy and I'll go, oh, well, I'm going to write a little comment on this. On <laughs> and then right away, right away, I'm a, I'm you a regret Luddite. It a little. I'm a Luddite. Right yeah. away. Right away. Yeah. Mm. You don't believe in technological. You don't believe in science. Institutions. Which is really yeah. funny. Because I'm, right. I'm the opposite of that. Yeah. I, I constantly read everything since I was in college. I was just enamored with science. Mm. And I can see where science has failed. Yeah. Yeah. Because some people cannot. Right. right. Well, Agriculture is particularly bad, I think. Yeah. 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 Well, part of, I think part of it is, I mean, part of it is that it, it's, a, it's a religion. To, for, yeah. Uh, yeah. It is a part religion. Is that, yeah. especially in the, well, the fruit and not not industry and in plant breeding and in institutions i mean the reason that people have been like people over the last hundred years have been breeding apples and pears and so on for the chemical companies i mean like, yeah oh yeah totally yeah so, it's like there's money involved there yeah and you know you're not going to get disease resistant plants from no a, no, no institution that's funded by chemical companies no even if it's you know roundabout yeah. Yeah, and I actually that what you just said, I never believed. Like I didn't believe what you just told me because I was like, no, they wouldn't do that. Yeah, we have to be but, even conscious. But then here's the I, yeah, and the ironic thing was, I was like, well, one of my employees worked for for one of those places, and I was like, well, are they all like that? I was shocked, and he goes, well, look up, you know, where the money's going, and I did. The state has a list, and I was like. Oh my gosh. It's exactly what you just said. Wow. <laughs> so like regular people have to be the ones. It is. Yep. Individuals. And, you know, yeah. And, and small groups and exchanging. It's the only way to do it. Yeah. <laughs> and and I, I do want to get, get to this, the idea of breeding. So like yes. in a way, like you're, what you're saying, but breeding is restricting the genetic pool. But really what we need to be doing yeah. is having a population mm -hmm. level like uh, enough genetic material so that it can. Yeah. Yeah. We, we talked with, with Joseph, he wrote the book Land Race Gardening. Yeah. That's oh, yeah. His main philosophy about it. But yeah. it, it, that's, it seems like that's the way we got to work. Like, right. Just selecting, just restricting the gene pool of the American chestnut, of course, they're going to fail. It's got to fail. There's no other way. They did. It's not turning out like they want it to. That's why it's not working. The plan has nothing to do with it. It's <laughs> The, it's not turning out like they want it to, and they got another way to give themselves another couple decades to make it happen. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, it's about control. Control. It's total control. Yeah. Instead of working with the plant and working with nature. There, there should be, by now, hundreds of varieties of American chestnut available. Hundreds of varieties. It could be done. It could have been done. 40 years ago when I first started. 
But the only reason it hasn't is because we're stuck in this mindset of, okay, we're going to bring all of this together. We're going to highly breed it. We're going to make a wild chicken here. It's yes. going to happen. Yeah. You know, a wild, highly domesticated chicken. Yes. yes. And the thing was, and the thing was that the, uh, there were individuals that I met and my planting, I was like, oh boy, this is really bad. Like my planting, if you went there today, you'd go, wow, Ken, good luck on that. Uh -huh. But I actually, I, I would, I'm harvesting the wood. I'm making the, the, the wood available for projects for people. And then the other part of it was, oh, it changed over that, in that 40 years or 30, yeah, 35 years that I grew it. Ah, this disease is changing. And so is the plant. I still have to cut down my trees. But now I have a way to evaluate my little planning and go, ah, I can do this. So even though it wasn't a success in terms of like creating a American tree, it did create very vigorous and healthy trees. And I can see a way out now. Before I couldn't. Mm -hmm. So a lot of my, my big trees that were just so spectacular, when that disease comes, it wiped them out and it was, it's a little pummeling. Let me tell you, because you have some trees that are, you know, two foot across and you watch them die. Yeah. So you're like, Ooh, why? Oh. It's hard. don't, don't look over there. Yeah. <laughs> but in that process, you, then you go, wait a minute, is there some salvation here from this? And there was the wood. So that was an initial thing. And I gave some wood away and. People made bowls out of it and they paid a lot of money for the wood for this one nonprofit. I didn't, I just gave it to them for free, but there were so many people, woodworkers that had not worked with American chestnut. Oh, oh my gosh. They were so excited. So the yeah. bids were quite high. Nice. You know, yeah, it was good. They made some money on that. But the idea of having, you know, it's some, it's something about the way people view plants. And I think it's, they don't understand that disease is really a way to improve a plant. Hmm. It, it, it creates a situation where it's like, oh, we've got to move. We're in our little genetic cocoon and this is coming and this will strengthen our, our genome. Because the disease will say, look, we have to make some changes here, whether it's a vegetable plant or whether it's in a population le level like Joseph Lofhouse, he did, it's a wonderful thing. That guy is a genius, in my opinion. What he did was he, he did it with vegetables. And you can do the same with woody plants. And the idea is then you, all of a sudden, now the plants go, well, we have a chance to respond to that. Ha ha. You know, and you can move a whole population forward by this impetus by the disease. Yeah. So the disease, as bad as it is, yes, you don't want disease, but Eventually, something's going to show up. And whether it's black knot or chestnut blight, there is a way to move population outside of that. And the plant will tell you. Yeah. The plants will tell you. And it's a lot faster for annual vegetables. And maybe that's part of it for chestnut. Yeah. Since their time scale is just like a lot. Uh, it's a lot bigger. It is. But, that, but we do have all of these different diseases happening. It seems like, you know, we've got like beach Beach bark disease, right? Got the uh, the woody adalgids on the hemlocks, right? Right. Where we are now, all the ash trees are dying. Back where I was in Pittsburgh before, they had, they died ten years ago. Yeah, and up in upstate New York, they're just starting to die now. But it just seems like every every year there's a a, a different disease, right? And sometimes just waiting to see the effect is too. Like with the ash tree, they're finding ash trees that are immune to those. Right. Well, ash spores. And, and I asked somebody about that. What is it? And they go, tannic acid. It's something huh. to do with the level of tannic acid in the, in the trees. Huh. Huh. Makes sense. So, yeah, it's amazing. Amazing. Yeah. I didn't think it existed. I was like, well, I guess that's the end of those ash. And it's not. No. Mm. They're going to be around. But do we recognize that? That's, I, I didn't even know that. So, Right. But that's, that's so you could easily, and within a short period of time, you could find those, make a population, and distribute yeah. the seeds. It wouldn't right. take right. that hard. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I remember in, in Pennsylvania, 
the next year after all the all the ash trees died, you know, it was about a, a few years of process. There were suddenly ash seedlings everywhere. Hmm. Yeah. And so some of, I mean, it seems like a lot of those seedlings were probably pre blight, but uh, not blight borer, but yeah. There's, I don't know. I feel like they they must have gained some epigenetic. They do. Oh yeah, thing. they do. Knowledge. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. It's it. It's within within the DNA already. They know. Mm. There is just a dumb plan. No. Yeah, I think that's part of the 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 problem with the worldview of yeah. the scientists in the institutions who are breeding this slow con controlled way is that they don't see plants really as living beings or as conscious. No. Beings. No. Yeah, so that actually brings us to one thing we should just discuss, you know, is consciousness in plants. You know, this, this whole field is opening wide, wide open. And what we're seeing is people are understanding plants to be far more intelligent and far more interactive with the environment than we previously thought. Yeah. Human consciousness has an effect on plant consciousness and vice versa. Yeah. Yes, for sure. So we're seeing some information on that and there is even studies that are just whoa yeah yeah and 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 i will say this i've had some experiences running my nursery and experiences with the plants at my farm and elsewhere i'm like that that is not normal <laughs> you know what i mean what? Like, what happened but, well here's the thing is that i've discussed with other plant breeders and they go ken come here and then we'll, we'll, we'll have some conversation like it's some sort of secret cult or something. Yeah. But I think it's just some emotional connection yeah. to those plants that kind of enters within our own awareness. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it could be something very specific. It could be a healing thing that people experience. Uh, but that's normal. It's normal and desirable. And people, if they sometimes just they let their mind settle down a little bit, they may experience that, maybe not. But over time, if you work with something that you love, it may, it's just like a dog, a pet dog. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it comes back to you in, in return in some way. Yeah. And you'll feel this. You will feel this. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a kind of communication that isn't mental. No. It's intuitive. It's feeling-based. Right. Some of the greatest right. plant breeders of all time, I mean, like George Washington Carver, Luther yeah. Burbank, they had those kind of, you know, experiences in dreams or. Yes. The plant. Yeah. Yes. And so it's, it's like, you know, we don't, we don't like to, in, from the modern materialistic, you know, atheist yeah. nihilistic worldview, it's not possible, but it happens all the time. It does. It does. And it's funny that some of the hardcore scientists that I know and some of the People that have plant collections, they'll let on to that sometimes yeah. with me anyway, because they, I usually will like want to talk about stuff like that. And they go, Ken, I've got something here. <laughs> something happened to me. It's yeah, almost like I'm a priest and I'm listening to a confession or something. Yeah, <laughs> totally. You know, I'm, just, I'm like, well, this is a wonderful thing you're experiencing. <laughs> It's good. Yeah. It's a normal, a normal thing, but it's something that people don't spend a lot of time with, trying to connect with nature on that level. But, you know, you have these other, what would you consider, means that people use, like a drug-related thing or like ayahuasca or something. Yeah, yeah. And the and entheogens. Mark, yeah, and it's like, well, okay. I wouldn't say that's bad necessarily, but, you know, you're damaging, you may damage a very that your instrument for this connection even more doing that you know the human nervous system is a little yeah it can be very sensitive to these changes and doing doing other sorts of methods may damage it yeah 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 sure. I've, I've been reading a book by another michigan michiganer from last century joseph sedoni are you familiar with him no, uh, uh, no. He was a great, a, a great intuitive. He, he was friends with a lot like Albert Einstein and lots of other people. But he wrote this book called Gates of the Mind. And he's, oh. he was like basically psychic. But he, yeah. he, he was all about training his nervous system 
to be a radio receiver basically and huh. and to be very like clean and pure and in touch with and you had to be in touch with that instead of sure. uh, you know it's a different path but i can yeah. see how definitely yeah other things can there, there's a lot of different paths yeah so, in, the, in terms of using the the nervous human nervous system to communicate with with plants, yeah, I think it's it's a sensitivity. Yeah, okay? and you can definitely damage that. But it's also whatever you work with, you build more intuition with too. Like if you work yeah. with plants and you then you, but like there are people who communicate with their cars who are uh, me mechanics. Mm, yeah, you know, also hell you know, yeah. kind of living it's you know living entity, but yeah, whatever you're working with, whatever you spend time with, and you get to know right right <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't know that about mechanics so well, some, I, Come on, some. see you can do it you know they're they're dr talking to their car you know <laughs> sure <laughs> but yeah they're not they're, i mean I, maybe cars are a little different but there yeah, there there are mechanics who yeah well we we understand animal and human yeah well, pretty good more and more and we see people who are gifted with animals and but we don't see people that are gifted with plants necessarily. Um, yeah, not as many. But yeah, I don't think because what can you do? But people have such strong opinions about plants too. And then I was like, oh boy, that puts you up. <laughs> you're, you're moving farther away from the plants, you know, to make judgment calls about plants. But people do that all the time. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think but, to communicate uh, with plants, uh, there's an element of having to drop from your head into your heart. Yes, there is. The same with the animals because you're not speaking English to plants. No, or to animals. no, no. And so if you can quiet that chatter and that, you know, mental, those mental blocks and just sort of drop into your heart and be open to the messages right. that you receive, it's not, maybe not going to be in English, but maybe it's a feeling or maybe it's like a relation right. of colors Image, or... yeah. Yeah, so they yeah, definitely there's, want to talk to us, and they're so patient with us, right? Like these plants, yes. oh, like oh, finally, always some giving. Humans, yeah, are always giving, <laughs> and they're just like, I've been speaking English for so many years now, but you know, eventually, some humans are going to figure out how to speak plant, <laughs> and some do. Well, as an herbalist, you probably realize this um, because you know that somewhat an herb will help a person no matter what. Yeah. There doesn't even have to be understanding. You don't have to know that. Yeah. And it'll okay. still help a person. Mm -hmm. Isn't that amazing? I mean, yeah. it really is. Yeah. It, it We've, really we're is. kind of removed from that now with modern medicine. But with the with herbal, different herbal things, it can be, you can elicit a response, a, a healing response from an herb that you don't even know. Or even, yeah, you don't have to believe in it. No belief. Yeah. Nothing. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you chew a leaf of the Spilanthes toothache plant and your mouth is going to be salivating. And, you know, like that's that's one that really gets people to be like, oh, yeah, herbs do do something. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's true. Mm -hmm. Very true. Yeah. Well, Ken, this has been an uh, hey, wow. Yeah, yeah, this is fun. So. So you're the Oikos is not you're not a nursery anymore in terms of you're not sell, selling trees anymore, but you do have seeds available sometimes. Yeah. So what I did the last two years, I harvested my crops, you know, and put them in seed form in bulk. And you know, I I make some money doing that. It was enough to keep the farm going for a while. Um, but I'm really trying to hoping. I'm working with one other nursery now, and I'm hoping others will be able to offer the varieties again mm -hmm. at some level. So that's kind of slowly doing that. Not in a rush, though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Really, I just want to take people out and collect fruit out there. It's so much fun. Especially awesome. people that don't know what pawpaws taste. I love having yeah. meet people out there. They yeah. don't know. All these so, new, new flavors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the farming, the farming group, some of them are more experimental. I like having them out there, but I really have just rather have normal people that have never eaten any of that because it's more, it's more fun. It's just more fun, okay. more open, you know? So, yeah. but uh, yeah, the seeds. And then as far as the farm goes, trying to clean it up is a mess out there. Holy cow. <laughs> because after, after, after I sold everything and I just kind of dropped, I had to take a break. 
Yeah, that makes sense. So then I went back to playing my music again more and really? learning how to song write. Awesome. Uh, taking okay. time to personal stuff for my home and family and yeah. Awesome. What do you play? Play guitar. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. You can if you go to my YouTube thing, YouTube Oikos Tree Crops on YouTube, you'll see one instrumental song there that I put up recently. Sweet. So I'm trying to get my staying voice back and function. No. But then when I started writing, I think I've got it here, but I, when I started writing music or actual lyrics, I was like, boy, this is not, not, this is not working. So yeah. I, took a, oh, no. I, I took a class uh -huh. with Mary Gauthier is her name. She's a very nice singer songwriter. And I found out there were a lot of people like me that, you know, have difficulties with with writing songs. So I'm trying to get back into it again. That's so, so cool. I yeah. love that. Yeah, it's fun to do. So Yeah, Isaac's an amazing songwriter. He's a musician. Really? Yeah. Excellent. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. I'm 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 on I'm on hiatus now though. He's more he's like was musician, now more nurseryman. Yeah. So he's doing the switcheroo like you're doing from yes. more nurseryman to music. So hmm. <laughs> very interesting. Yeah. Well, we can play together. Yeah. <laughs> You have to come up and, and visit the visit the farm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I'd love What's to. the best time of year to come if we're going to come? If you come to the farm, the best time is in September and October because there's so many things ripening all at once. Yeah. Pears. I have a wild pear orchard. Apples and persimmons start in September. And papa start in September, mid, mid September or so. Yeah. All right. Cool. And people can it's come. Your, your email list. Do you write blog posts every now and then too? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Cool. Well, well thank you very much, Ken. Hey, thank you. All right. Good chat. It was you had awesome. fun. <laughs>